Well, good evening, everybody. Hello and welcome. Welcome. Anyone here a member of the Basket of Deplorables? Anyone here? <laughs> you know, incidentally, Kentucky Fried Chicken came out with a new menu item. You can get your six-piece basket, your 12-piece basket, and your now Basket of Deplorables. <laughs> um, did you hear uh, Donald Trump recently uh, went and visited with Dr. Oz and uh, you know, explained his health and sat down and went through his health history? But you don't know that next week he's going to do that on immigration with Dora the Explorer. <laughs> I stole all these jokes, so, you know, stole them from the late night guys. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about the presidential election. You know, a lot of people are torn between Trump and Hillary. Uh, but there's some alternative candidates out there. Have you heard of Jill Stein before? Jill Stein's running for the Green Party. If you don't know who Jill Stein is, just imagine a Bernie Sanders rally and imagine the lady in the back of the Bernie Sanders rally selling the dream catchers. That's Jill Stein. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, thanks so much for coming out. We really appreciate it. We know the election's on everyone's mind. Um, and I have spent a lot of time with pollsters over the years, and there are... Um, few out there I trust, uh, some have gotten it terribly, terribly wrong. I, I worked for Mitt Romney, and uh, the m Monday morning uh, before uh, the election, the pollster on a national conference call told us that we were going to win by four points in Colorado. So I go out to all of our coalition leaders, I go to John Caldera in this big meeting, and I say, we're going to win by four, and next morning we lost by six. Um, and uh, <laughs> it was a little embarrassing. Um, so, so there's really only a handful of people that I really trust that I think get it right, and we're going to hear from one of them tonight, David Flaherty, which is very exciting. Um, we also have Vince McGuire with us, who uh, is from the University of Colorado, who's going to do some teaching on the Electoral College, um, why we have the Electoral College, why that's important, how it's going to fit into this election. So we're, we're blessed to have Dr. Vincent McGuire with us from the University of Colorado tonight. Um, but before we begin, um, we always start by doing a pledge and a prayer, so I'll invite a few students up if you want to come on up. Mr. Brandon Yates, Mr. Evan Verbal, come on up and lead us in the pledge and prayer. And if you don't mind, uh, if you can and are able, please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you would pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we come before you grateful for the chance that we have this November to engage in democracy, to cast our vote, to have our voice heard in a way that the founders of the church simply did not. We do not serve Caesars. We serve a government that, even with all of its problems, is still of the people, by the people, and for the people. We thank you for that. I pray that you will guide the leaders who will be elect in November and that, above all, Father, you will restore our nation to be one nation under God, that you will do away with the division, even the violence that has characterized this electoral season between various factions and unite us behind the common vision of one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. I pray that you will bring us peacemakers. You say blessed are the peacemakers, and we need peace and we need unity and we need healing in this nation. Please guide us, please guide these speakers to inform us about this election, and I pray that in November, your will will be done, a nation will be restored, and the law of the Constitution, the law of your word, will be once again put on high in our nation. In your name, amen. So uh, go ahead and grab a seat. A few announcements before we get started. Um, this is our Issue Monday. If you've ever been to an Issue Monday before, we do these once a month. And um, we, we kind of tackle tough and controversial issues that a lot of people are talking about. We've discussed China. We've discussed doctor-assisted suicide. Tonight we're diving into the election. Next month we're going to have Francis Beckwith from University of Colorado. He's their visiting scholar in conservative thought. Um, they actually have to create a chair at the University of Colorado for conservative thought and put somebody in there. Um, otherwise, I don't think they'd have very many conservative. I think Dr. Vincent McGuire might be the only other one up there. <laughs> um, but uh, we'll have Francis Beck with next month, and then John Andrews the month after that. I want to talk a little bit about Brandon Yates and some of our uh, interns here. You got to see Evan Verbal as well. We have Ellen Densmore in the back, Joe Maroney. So um, 
We had our President Circle dinner, which is a major donor dinner, uh, just this last week on Wednesday, I believe. And uh, they invited four students from the entire campus to come speak before our major donors during the President's Circle. Three of those came from the Centennial Institute here. There are interns, Brandon Yates being one of them, Ellen Densmore, raise your hand, and Joe Maroney. They really are, we do have the best of the best here, so make sure you connect with those students. You're gonna be voting for them someday, I guarantee you, and thanks so much, Brandon, I appreciate it. Um, in fact, David French from National Review visited and he wrote an article just recently about our students going, they are the, um, and quote me if I'm wrong, but the anti, correct me if I'm wrong, the anti-millennial conservative millennials are at Colorado Christian University. They're bucking the trend, they're far more conservative, and he even said they're more thoughtful and focused on America's founding principles than he was when he was 20 or 25 years old. He was just enamored by our students, and that was a result of him visiting our campus last week. So please connect with them. They are great, great people you want to get to know. So a um, few more upcoming announcements, and then, we'll get s uh, then I'll get to the bios. We have the Values Voters Bus from Family Research Council will be here on Thursday for lunch. We're pro providing free pizza mostly designed for the college students, but if you want some free pizza, come on out and meet the Family Research Council people. They'll be here with their big bus talking about um, issues important to us during this election, religious freedom, marriage, abortion, and uh, those types of things. Um, Michael Ferris, the Chancellor Patrick Henry, will be giving a presentation on the Convention of States, which um, is, a, is a kind of a movement to host a new constitutional convention October 13th here. And then finally, like I mentioned, Francis Beckwith and John Andrews coming. All of this is on our website. If you go to centennial.ccu.edu, you can visit it there. So now let's move on to our speakers. I'll read a few bios and then we'll welcome up Dr. Vincent McGuire. Born in Brooklyn, New York, Dr. Vincent McGuire received his BA from the University of Colorado in 1975 and his MA in politics from New York University in 1985. He taught high school in New York until 1989 he entered the graduate program at the University of Colorado where he received his PhD in 1995. He has taught at CU ever since. From 2011 to 2013, he taught at the American University in, now correct me if I'm wrong, Solmania, in, Solmania <laughs> in Kurdistan, saying it was the highlight of his professional career, having students who had one goal in Kurdistan to help their nation, and most have gone on to have successful careers. His wife, Melissa, and their youngest son, Matthew, live in Lafayette, Colorado. Melissa works for a startup biotechnology firm. Matthew is attending a local high school, playing football and taking classes as a junior. His two older children, Dennis and Carrie, live in Lafayette and San Francisco, respectively. David Flaherty is the CEO and founder of Magellan Strategies. He's a pollster, data miner, master of political data. That is in your bio. He's like a superhero campaign consultant and strategist. David has been in the business of campaigns, politics, survey research, predictive data modeling, and political data analysis since 1992. Prior to forming Magellan Strategies in Colorado at the end of 2006, David worked in Washington, D.C. for 14 years at the Republican National Committee, Americans for Prosperity, the U.S. House of Representatives, and a government affairs firm. He's consulted on more than 75 political and grassroots campaigns across the country and is an expert in applying survey research, census and political data demography, uh, redistricting technology, and a statistical and predictive analysis to make better decisions in the po political government and public affairs arenas. He graduated University of Delaware in 1991 and resides in Broomfield with his wife Jennifer and their two sons, Jack and Bobby. To begin the night, we're gonna start with Dr. Vincent McGuire on the Electoral College. Mr. McGuire. Good evening. Uh, it's nice to be here, or at my age, it's nice to be anywhere. <laughs> Jeff stole my joke about deplorables, but uh, just imagine in your mind that I had a really good... Uh, in any case, I'm here to talk about the Electoral College, and why should we talk about the Electoral College? First, we're a think tank. We're here to think. Okay, beyond that. Beyond that is that I strongly believe, which doesn't make it true, 
that a lot of the frustration Americans have with politics is because they don't understand our institutions or what they're supposed to do. I teach uh, at the university and these kids come in with no knowledge, just the most simplest stuff. They have no idea. And the Electoral College is probably the most uh, intricate, arcane, but it's really not that difficult if you can understand the principles of the Constitution and the entire American government. So, what are the principles, or as I like to call it, the, uh, the spirit of the Constitution? Not lawyers and all that stuff, and I don't do that stuff. I, I just don't, I don't care. What originally did the founders think? What was their idea? Well, it's very simple. Go to the Declaration of Independence to find out why we have government. It's, it is, it's that simple. Go to the Declaration. Jefferson says the purpose of government is to secure us in our natural rights. Okie dokie. That's what our government's supposed to do. But what about, please, you're killing me. I don't care what you think you need or want or if you decide not to run a government by principles but by fiat, and what I'm getting at here is tyranny, all is lost. All is lost. Make no mistake that the changes to the Electoral College came out of the progressive movement. Now, way back in the late 1800s, but this is a progressive idea that they want to do away with the Electoral College. And you might hear that there are people who want to bring in a national vote. We all vote for the president. And if these people understood the principles of the Constitution, well, how do you operationalize? How do you put into effect? What is your framework of government for protecting our natural rights? Checks and balances. Checks and balances are the most brilliant thing in order to have a system which is free and prevent tyranny. That's basically it. What we have to do is have each institution in its own planet, in its own sphere, and not going after the other guys and trying to get away with it. Now, that's more toward the end. Um, can I take this off? I got it. Sorry, I'm like the Suns Dance Kid. I shoot better when I move. Hello. Oh, this works too. Thanks a lot. So what I'm trying to concentrate on here is checks and balances to prevent tyranny. Let's just do a little bit. What are checks and balances? It's divided into three areas. The separation of powers, the executive, legislative, judicial, bicameralism, a two-house legislature, and federalism. The approximate division of power between the national and the state governments, approximate. By having each of these, the House and the Senate, fight it out and compromise, the executive and the Congress fight it out and compromise. Huh, that brings up a thought. Why is the Affordable Care Act the most anti-constitutional act in recent memory? There was no compromise. No, I don't care uh, any word in the entire bill. I couldn't care less. There was no compromise. Which, if you understand the American system, that's why there are so many people against it. They weren't a part of the process. If you're not a part of the process, you've been kicked out. You're a loser, and you seek revenge. That's what the founders are trying to avoid, and they've done it pretty well. Which, again, is kind of another thing. What has the Electoral College done wrong that you need to get rid of it? But 
checks and balances, especially at the national level, come in a few different forms. And what I have up here is the way in which elections work. Whoops. All righty. Now, I do, I think this is rather important to, to understand exactly what's going on here. Anybody think I can get up there again? So, what we have here is the people are sovereign. That's it. Everything comes from the people. But, the people are not entitled to vote. Why? We're not a democracy, which comes as a huge um, prob surprise for many people. Democracy comes from two Greek words, demos, meaning people, kratos, meaning rule. The people don't rule. They're the sovereign. They are the reason all of this is given legitimacy. We allow this to work. Now, it might not seem it. It really mightn't, but that's the problem of a lack of civic education. So what we have here is the people directly elect the House of Representatives. They go for two-year terms. That framework right there restricts the House of Representatives. That's what Madison was doing, was building a framework. Similar to, I don't know, if you're over in, in psychology and you're doing an experiment with white rats, you can construct the framework so that a mouse comes out wherever you want. Well, that's it. This is designed to do a very specific thing, which I'll get to. Now, the people elect the Senate for six-year alternating terms, and what does that say? I can't read it. Ah, there are people, there, they are, the people of the state elect senators, or as it used to be, state legislatures, which uh, if I'm allowed to come to that Constitutional Convention, I'll knock out the 17th Amendment. It destroyed the state. <laughs> How about let's do away with the 18th Amendment? Quick, more, more, come on. I'll do away with all of them, I get applause. <laughs> so, the Senate is elected by the people, but indirectly. And then we come here. President, people. Four years, state legislators used to appoint the Electoral College who went for the president. So what does this framework prevent? First, these guys are in there for two years and they want to get reelected. And they're like busy little beavers. I want to get something done. I have to get something done. I really, 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 really have to. I won't get elected. And then along comes the Senate who's elected for six years, and they're a little more moderate, a little more calm, and as Jefferson said, the Senate is the plate which cools the hot tea. The house is very hot, why? Two years, that's all you have to sell yourself. These guys can be more moderate. That's the point. And only one third of the Senate is elected every six years. What'd I say? No, senators every, uh, yes, I'm sorry, every two years, one third, thank you. And the president here, four years. So what you see is there will never be, although people are reelected quite often since World War II, members of the House of Representatives who have run for reelection have been elected by over 90% of the time. A house job is permanent. But what are we preventing here? These guys becoming too chummy with these guys. With human frailties, it happens. But you see what we're trying to prevent here is any of these groups getting together and forming what Madison called a faction. And for Madison, a faction is a group united contrary to the common good. 
what's the common good in a liberal society? Liberal, I mean the individual. Classical liberalism, I'm sorry. I saw some people taking out the knives there. So. <laughs> Anybody, Bill? Freedom? Yeah, freedom. That's the purpose of the government, and it's corollary to prevent tyranny. So, what does this have to do with the Electoral College? Well, it's a way in which to prevent faction. And what Madison was most uh, in favor of, his overall goal was that in order to protect our natural rights, what we had to do was have a government that wouldn't take them away. How do you do that? Checks and balances. But there's a problem. There's a real problem. Opposition. In the revolution, they were all united. I know the historian Bell tells us that one third were for the revolution, one third were against, and one third didn't care. But the people, the Federalists, were very united. Well, then comes along the, the election of John Adams. And who's his vice president but Thomas Jefferson? And they're of a different mindset. So then Jefferson runs against Adams in 1800. And what happens? The Electoral College comes along and helps. That's what it does. Well, how can the Electoral College help? The Electoral College helped Abe Lincoln. It worked in 1888. Some of you might be familiar with the election of 1888. Went by the constitutional provision and the House of Representatives elected the president. I'm not sure whether that would go over today if, if you know, just, egad, we just couldn't do that. So the problem of factions for Madison is that they were contrary to the common good. But what is the common good when you start to have two very different sects, portions, parties? The founders could not conceive of parties out of their experience in England. They just couldn't conceive of that type of thing, that there was a loyal opposition. Since they were all hugga-mugga on all the principles and the revolution, how could you be in opposition? And if you are in opposition, there's something wrong with you. How do you solve this? Really, how do you solve these kinds of problems? Once again, the framework. That's the idea. If we stick